the basic value of curiosity is saying, I don't know everything. I still need to go find out something. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I had the great pleasure of speaking with Sam and Nunez, a founding partner of WRNS Studio, an architecture firm with offices in San Francisco, Seattle, Honolulu, and New York. During his 40-year career, Sam has led numerous high-profile projects throughout the Western United States, including workplace campuses for Adobe, Intuit, and Microsoft. Recognized for beauty, sustainability, and a positive contribution to the public realm, Sam's work has been honored by professional associations, cities, and neighborhood groups for enhancing the distinct character of the communities they serve. Sam brings a creative management approach to the practice of architecture to endow leaders with autonomy and provide emerging talent with room for growth. He developed and implemented a sociocratic governance structure for WRNS Studio, which we're going to talk a lot about today. Uh, This non-hierarchical approach to governance has historically been employed by large production-based corporations looking to realize operational efficiencies. Sociocratic governance is atypical within architecture as it emphasizes and empowers a plurality of perspectives and voices rather than a singular creative vision. As a result of this decentralized authority, WRNS Studio is a team of incentivized, nimble and innovative leaders. While only 18 years old, WRNS Studio has twice been named for top firm in the US by Architect Magazine and was recognized as a Fast Company 2020 most innovative design firm. So this was a brilliant conversation. Absolutely loved speaking with Sam. We go into a lot of depth about the non-hierarchical and sociocratic governance system that they employ, how it works, how efficient it is, how it empowers individuals to be able to make their own decisions. We talk a lot about the difference between consent and consensus and how that plays a role in fast decision making. So we go into actually what that distinction is. And we talk a lot about financial communications and the importance of transparency within the business. So this episode. If you're on the leadership team of a architecture firm of any size and certainly a larger firm, uh, this is going to be filled with absolute gold. So sit back, relax and enjoy Sam Noons. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Sam, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Ryan? I'm very well, thank you. So you are the founding partner of WRNS Studio. You've uh, grown the practice. You are now, remember last time we were speaking, around around about 170 people split across four different locations. You've got San Francisco, New York, uh, Honolulu, and Seattle. Yes. And um, a very, a very interesting kind of philosophy where it's, you know, it's a kind of one studio but four locations uh, philosophy. You've got a very diverse portfolio of work, um, being involved in multifamily, residential, mixed use, uh, a lot of education work from higher ed to K-12 work, um, as well as being involved in civic projects and infrastructure. Um, and there's a real kind of, you know, core push of sustainability that's being driven by the practice so i guess the the first question is is perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the 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 beginning of the practice when when you founded it and 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 kind of how how has it changed since since then yeah our beginning uh so uh four of us uh founded wrna studio but john rufo brian Childs, jeff warren and myself but actually, you know, pretty quickly we had brought in um, some very senior people uh, that we had been working with. And and frankly, I, I think its founding was really a collection of about, you know, 10 folks that founded the studio back in 2005. Mm-hmm. And we'd been working together for a very long time. Um, and uh, John, Brian, Jeff, and I were actually minority partners at a firm called Tong partners in San Francisco. I had 
joined Gordon Song in 1985. I think I was his 10th employee at the time. You know, right out of school, I joined there. And uh, about seven years later, we'd started growing the firm. I think we were about 45 people, and we we brought in John Rufo out of Anchin and Allen. And Gordon made John and I partners at that time. So in the early 90s, I became a partner of, of Chong Partners. In fact, it was with Gordon Chong and Associates. And when John and I were made partners, we changed the name to Chong Partners. And about uh, half a dozen years later, we brought in uh, Brian Childs and Jeff Warner, and they became minority partners as well. And we grew that firm uh, from the 10 when I started to 200. And we had offices in San Francisco, Sacramento, San Diego, and and London, uh, mm-hmm. because we were we were deep into healthcare, you know, at that office, and we done we were fairly diverse there as well. We we did a lot of civic work, uh, which is what I was doing, a lot of K twelve work, which I was a part of as well, and um, and we tried to transition that firm, but you know, Gordon had founded that firm as a sole proprietor, like I said, in the early seventies. And he really, he hung on to that company. It was just such a huge part of his personal identity. I think he was just having a difficult time imagining that he might have to become less than um, the majority partner. And, you know, we had tried to transition it over probably five years, you know, off and on, just thinking about valuations and and how we might um, begin to move it. And, And frankly, the four of us, wanted to move the firm in different directions uh, than Gordon uh, wanted to move it. And just all of that sort of led to the fact that, well, actually what we had to do was sell our our shares back to Gordon, allow him to own 100% of the company, and to exit that company. So in 2005, that's what we did. And we founded uh, WNS Studio. And as I said, uh, about six others, you know, uh, came with us, Pauline Souza, Mitch Fine, Adam Oltag, uh, Brian Millman, Bright Sherman, uh, came came with us. And uh, yeah, we uh, we took a big risk and uh, a gamble on ourselves and said, let's let's go uh, start our own thing. What were the sorts of the first kind of projects that you brought in? And were they projects, obviously, that you'd um, you'd obviously had a, a kind of a lot of us experience with previously? and connections and networks with? Yeah. Uh, a, a good number of the projects that I was working on at Chong Partners um, came with me mm-hmm. and my partner, Pauline Souza. Uh, they came, those clients came with us, uh, and that really was important, and we're very grateful for that. Um, you know, there are all sorts of non-competes and non-solicitation, but we can't stop a client from deciding to do what they wanted to do. And so we just sure. got a few phone calls when we decided to leave. And some of these uh, clients uh, came with us, like the Jewish Museum or Hillsboro Schools and, and some others. And uh, that really helped us to get started. You know, Meanwhile, others were out seeking new works, but pretty much in the lines of things that we were interested in doing, those things that we were doing at at Chong Partners, but even uh, things that we were not doing there, but wanted to do, and so you know one of the tenets of our firm was that, that each of us would just follow our own enthusiasm, you know, or what we were curious about, uh, the things that drove us uh, as professionals, and and that just led to a great diversity of work right off the bat, and and we were we were known in the market. I mean, we I I was. My Chong partners, I was in the market for 20 years. My partners, John and Jeff, were 10 years or eight years my senior, so they had been in the market for 28 years. And what I mean by in the market, they were just known. They were known entities uh, in the fields in which they were working. And so, um, uh, yeah, work came came to us, I'm not to say easily, but fairly quickly, and we began to grow. Was there much... Um kind of proactive marketing and business development that you guys kind of switched into to gear to make sure that the pipeline was was well filled up for the next few months or or was it kind of a little bit more reactive and organic it was frankly just reaching out to our networks and having dinners and lunches and and just being present uh and putting who we were out there in 
uh, one of our values is authenticity in the most authentic way we could. This is who we are. This is what we can do. Um, being as nimble and agile as we could be, um, you know, as, as just getting going, there's lots of energy at that time. Um, Molly Thomas, who uh, was one of our uh, marketing coordinators at Kong Partners, wanted to come work with us. He came over. Uh, we established a way of communicating uh, with with the various places we could acquire work, and and so um, yeah, I would I would say in in the main it was just tapping into our our friends, you know what what people would call their network, but just the people we knew in the industry from from clients to builders to sub consultants and uh, engineers, and just getting re you know allowing people to know we were established. So the biggest um, question that people might have would be, you know, are we, you know, are we a legal entity? Do, do we, uh, have we set up the right insurances? You know, uh, you know, what kind of uh, uh, depth do we have? Um, you know, folks get a little nervous that you've only been in business a few weeks and then want to hand over a, a project to you. But if we could show that stability, you know, that we actually had an office and we had our technologies all established and, you know, once we could demonstrate that, I think it, it wasn't that difficult, actually. How fast did you did you grow? Like how how big did the team get, and yeah. over what kind of what kind of period? Because that brings all sorts of fun challenges. So you know, I know we're going to talk a bit about um, you know governance structure and how we make decisions, and that that's really all that is 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 how do you make decisions on on what you want to be doing and where you're going. Um, but also, we were very interested in establishing very early on a, a transition strategy, right? We we saw the thing we were building not as uh, we didn't want to hold it so closely uh, as a as a as a personal thing, but more we were building a vehicle into which you know for a while we would drive this vehicle, and then others would get to drive it as well as as the decades rolled forward. So after uh, our first year in business, when we realized that we were um, we were established. We we had grown to about 25 people at that time. We decided to make those senior people I spoke of earlier uh, uh, partners of our firm, and so uh, we took, you know, our ownership and began to distribute it down um, in sort of cascading quantities to these these senior people. So by the end of the first year, we were about 25, 30 people, and and 10 of us, you know, actually were partners of of the firm. Uh, that established this idea of transition, right? So mm -hmm. there's 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 cascading um, ages involved in that, and levels of ownership, and there's sort of a a very clear path of buy-in and investment and return, and all that could be communicated uh, clearly to what we were trying to do, and that established uh, immediately this this idea of us just being temporary stewards of the firm that we were we were just piloting it for a while and. And then others would pilot pilot it later and take it wherever they wanted to take this vehicle that we were we were building, and that was highly motivating. You know, people uh, really uh, leaned in to this uh, to this model and way of being. And of course, now we've got more people with their own enthusiasms, right? They're the things they're trying to achieve uh, professionally in their careers, and that began to drive our growth. And so we had twenty twenty five percent growth. Uh, year over year until we hit uh, 2009 or so, you know, when the Great Recession uh, hit. That didn't really affect us too badly. It just slowed our growth because clearly, you know, in our just in our back of the napkin modeling, it was pretty obvious, you know, we were going to be growing into a firm of at least about 100 um, just in the markets we were in and what, what our capabilities were. And so that might have slowed us a bit, and we sort of held at around 60, you know, uh, or so folks, 70 folks coming out of that recession in 2010, and then we just really took off. And at our largest, we were about 205, um, and and roughly that size, maybe um, you know 180, 190 through the um, through the pandemic, and then you know the returned office policies and sort of where we exist and and uh, the, the sort of reimagining and rethinking of what these environments we build are for have slowed us a little bit while our clients uh, kind of begin to understand, 
you know, their needs and what they're doing. And so we're, we're roughly about 170 now, but I would imagine 2024, 25, we're projecting growth. Um, as, as sort of we've, uh, there's a, a uh, uh, that reimagining that we're a part of with these clients, uh, it takes root and, and we can, um, discover what the work is ahead of us. What kinds of challenges did you have with kind of going up to that that size, and and when did you start um, opening up other locations? Yeah, so the challenges. So the the um, the the way we the way we're organized. So imagine after that first year, you have ten people who call themselves partners. So we we have a certain amount of autonomy, right? We have a a certain agency. Um, there isn't a hierarchical structure where, uh, say, back at Chong Partners, where there is a uh, a majority partner who kind of makes the last call, right? And that everything had to flow into that last call. Well, this doesn't quite work that way. So this is that this is that structure that began to emerge naturally for us because of of who we were, a group of people who share certain values, who have um, who share certain goals and aims in the profession. And now you have this group of people and you have to decide, well, how is it that we work together? How do we, how do we move ourselves forward as efficiently as, as we can? And so, um, I was aware, uh, I had spent a couple of years in business school at San Jose State and I was aware of a few models that kind of did that. And, and I began to talk about these models, but not in any, um, formal way, not in any way of like, here are the, here are the rules of this game and, 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 this governance structure is the most important thing. It's the least important thing. It's simply a thing that allows us to talk to one another about the rules of the road and decision making. So the sociocratic governance structure um, is one where you really drive down as far as possible within your organization decision making. And so the way it sets up, it's, it's you can imagine each project is its own concern. Each business function like HR or finance marketing is its own concern and it has it has a very small group of people that are engaged in it maybe five to ten folks you know at a project level the largest might be 20 but it's not much more than that and if you can imagine that those systems work semi-autonomously from the broader organization they get to make their decisions and move forward based on those values based on the aims and goals that are well understood by the organization. And then in our system, because there are, you know, so many partners, the two of us are engaged in any of those functions at any time, right? So so two of us are engaged in a project or two of us are engaged in HR functions, so forth and so on. And so we provide a link back up to what's called a leadership circle. So the 10 of us then form a leadership circle. And in the main, that leadership circle has a very important um, function within the organization, but it isn't making all the decisions for the organization mm-hmm. because that's happening down below. And it's a consent-based system, so certain things might rise. So what would rise into that circle would be things that you might imagine might live at the margins of our aims and goals, right, that we've agreed upon, things that we might see as uh, uh, a threat to our identity or brand or or an opportunity that might require a much deeper discussion amongst us about how best uh, to realize that opportunity. So, so you know, this this circle meets once a week, and we have these conversations about things that are happening, and basically keeps the organization on on its track. Um, and that's a very flat organizational structure, right. and and it, but it is an organizational structure. There is a bit of hierarchy in it, right? I, just the word leadership circle tells you there's somewhere you go uh, when when things need to go there. But you try to keep things from going there because what you're trying to do is empower, uh, you know, the, the, the talents and skills and in the, the basic intelligence of everybody in the firm just to figure out how to do things better. Mm. And once you can once you can find that, then you can transfer that into the broader organization and just keep moving. So that's that's very interesting. And I, it, so this is uh, consent based as opposed to consensus based kind of decision making. Yes. And and so it's a very big distinction, by the way. Do, would you would you care to go in a little bit more about what that means? The difference between consent versus consensus. 
yeah, the uh, where the system can bog down is at that leadership level. That's where right. it can bog down. So it's very efficient. You could imagine, you know, at the project level or at the business function level, it could be an extremely efficient way of, of moving forward uh, because you don't have to go through these hierarchical chains, right? And and you can't get derailed by just one person's opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, but when things get to the leadership level, it can get bogged down because you're now you have a big conversation about something that's risen to that point that that is going to require some some big conversation. Which if you were if you were seeking consensus on that, like everybody agrees this is the right thing to do, or everybody agrees this is the wrong thing to do, that could take that could go way outside of normal business cycle timelines and and you 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 get stuck in the in the mire but if you're if you're seeking simple simple consent then you can move much faster and consent is simply um saying that you could live with it so so you would take whatever whatever the issue is in front of you and say well do i see that as an existential threat to our business is it somehow so far outside of our value sets or or not consistent with our aims and goals, uh, that I need to really object to this, and I need to keep fighting the fight. Or, eh, you know, not what I would do, but I could live with that. You know, I, I think it's not going to destroy us, and I think it's okay, you know, and it just is not the way I would go. And so that's that's consent, right? And so that doesn't mean you don't have serious conversations, and, and sometimes maybe even heated ones. Sure. But in the main, you recognize you're not trying. You're not trying to convince me and change my my opinion completely. You're simply trying to say, can you set your opinion aside? Can you see setting your opinion aside and allowing us to move forward? Um, and so that's what consent based decision making is, and it's central to this sociocratic system. This circle structure mm-hmm. is central to that because otherwise, it's pretty clear you would simply not be able to keep up with. Uh, decision making within normal business cycle uh, time frames. Are, are there are there predefined topics or areas that automatically get kind of passed up to the leadership circle? Oh, there are things that are relatively consistent. You know, um, types of projects we might uh, one of us might want to pursue that we think might represent a bit of a stretch for mm-hmm. us. Uh, you know, we'll talk about um, uh, the kinds of uh, of, of uh, public uh, uh, PR we might uh, we, we we might be doing, and do we want to do that? Uh, we've established a foundation. Things of that nature will will um, you know how we want to use our monies and and mm-hmm. uh, distribute those, you know, both internally and externally, and the causes we want to be a part of. Those are the kinds of things we. Uh, we talk about it as a group. You mentioned earlier that you've, you know, the, the business has a set of values. What role do the values play in kind of leading to consent and making sure that decisions get made quickly? They 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 play a, a large role, but I would I would say we joined each other because we share those values. We didn't post a bunch of values on the wall and say you need to believe in these values. It's like we we. And when we hire, we we seek out people who already share these values. So authenticity and curiosity and transparency and honesty, um, you know, these are the things. Competence, these these mm-hmm. are the values, you know, we believe in. We walk around the firm and say, you know, that doesn't feel very authentic to me. It feels like you're forcing it. You know, I mean, things things of that nature, right? So so so. It's like making friends, right? I mean, you're going to make friends with, with, with people. It doesn't mean you're the same. In fact, it's not good if you're exactly the same. But you share something, and you know you share it. And so when we left uh, Chong Partners, you know, the four of us wanted to work together, and we knew the people we wanted to work with because we shared in these values. And the names and goals are like, you know, beauty and sustainability and a uh, a uh, positive contribution to the public realm, which you know we we define uh, continuously: uh, happy clients and happy us, and a fair return on our investments. Those are the things you know that those are our aims and goals under those values that we uh, atop of those values, I suppose you know that I talked about. So and, if you and, share in those things, and honestly, this system doesn't work if you don't share in those things. 
You can't right. force this, right? You need yeah. to, it has to begin with, we share a certain perspective, you know, on, on the profession, on life in general. We share this perspective. It doesn't make us the same, and there's plenty of conflict that needs to be worked out, um, as there is with any uh, group of people trying to work in common purpose towards something. Um, but if you don't share in these things, um, then it's going to be very hard to overlay this flat organizational structure onto mm -hmm. what you're trying to do. With this organizational structure, with the kind of, you know, when you're managing 170 different people, do they, are they in, in the, are they kind of divvied up into like sector based groups or was it more like a studio unit type of approach inside the business or was it much smaller cellular? groups of people that work together and then kind of come to consent in smaller groups before anything would ever go to the leadership circle. Yeah, the, so I'm trying to follow exactly what you said there, but let me just say, so the projects are ascendant in our office, right? So they, they sort of occupy, if you can imagine, they occupy real estate. And right. then we, we assemble a team around that. And, mm -hmm. and certain people have desires. They, they want to do K-12 schools or they, they're really interested in workplace then they tend to do those sorts of projects. Others move about more generalist. They, they move about, and all that's welcomed and encouraged in the firm, whichever way you, a person would like to, um, you know, develop their skills and their talents. You know, we, we try to uh, just put that into the natural flow of our business. But the project occupies the real estate. The people surround that. And you can imagine those people surrounding that project. You know, there are skill sets there. Right. So there's there's uh, leadership and and management, leadership and design. Uh, there are uh, there are skill sets, you know that that are thirty years deep down to you know an intern, right? So there are different skill sets, but they surround that project, and we encourage you know dialogue and participation um, uh, by everybody on that project, whatever whatever the level of of skill is, you know, relative to time. Um, we want that conversation to be happening because you never know uh, where that conversation might lead. We want lots of drawings. We want lots of model building. We want a big exploration because mm -hmm. curiosity is a big thing. We want to remain curious. Like, you know, we yeah, we did that last time, but what's, may, maybe that could lead us somewhere different. And we want to be open to those possibilities, right? So, so in in that circle of people surrounding that project, they're making the call. Now they're bringing it out, right? That we'll have firm-wide critiques, or we'll they'll bring in people to say, "Hey, take a look at this." But they're they're making those decisions. Now in that circle, there are two partners typically in that circle somewhere, and and so they can double. It's called a double linking. I hate these terms. Uh, it's a double linking. It's a feedback loop that allows any issues going on within that project to be floated back up to the leadership circle pretty quickly with people who really understand what the issue is. They're deep into the issue. Mm -hmm. So if there, there happens to be an issue that needs to get up to that leadership group, those two partners can communicate what that is uh, without, uh, you know, without wasting a lot of time sort of unearthing what's truly happening there. So the partners acting as the double links to the, to the feedback loop back to the leadership circle. If, if things need to be discussed there, you know, can move that conversation pretty quickly through the leadership circle and they're highly trusted. All the partners are trusted and yeah. Is, is this, is this more kind of in the realm of kind of specialist technical design knowledge and experience or does it relate back to other topics as well? This kind of double linking communication. Method? Uh, well, it could be, it could come from anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. it could come from the, you know, deep thinking in, in environmental stewardship and sustainability. It could come through managerial structures, uh, managerial aspects of the project. It could be the design aspects of the project. It just depends on the scale of the project, how, you know, uh, how that team was assembled to take on the work. Um, mm -hmm. It isn't always the partners in the leadership role on the project level, but they're engaged in the project. You know, you get what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah, it really, it, it, it really, it varies very much, which you've got to be, uh, yeah, you got to be open to, you know, In, you can't, you can't try to hold too tightly to anything. Absolutely. Very, very fascinating. Um, and in terms of the, the financial communication of projects, 
uh, and just money and profit and tracking tracking where the business is is at how how transparent are you with the team how does that information get communicated what kind of knowledge uh, financial knowledge do project managers have for example with with projects are they aware of you know kind of profit margins and what the profit targets are on project and they're they're kind of you know they're very much active in creating budgets for time allowances and resources yeah we're uh all of that. I mean, we're extremely transparent with all of that information. I mean, transparency is one of our <laughs> it's one of our values uh, because we think with knowledge people can do their jobs better. So we're we're very transparent with all of that. And 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 financially, ultimately, the way it works is we're one studio. So it isn't anyone's particular uh, fault that a project might go uh, might have trouble financially. There are all kinds of reasons why projects might have trouble financially, um, which has nothing to do with a person didn't check the right box at the right time. Uh, conversely, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's wonderful and you can applaud someone doing extremely well financially on a project, but it's not wholly, the circum, that circumstance isn't wholly of their making either. There are all kinds of things that cause that to happen. So ultimately what we do is we, we roll everything up uh, across, you know, all four locations. Uh, they're, they're, they're not profit centers. We're one studio, which is, you know, what that really means. We just roll everything up at the end of the year and say, how did we do this year? And then um, based on a model that we've built, we just distribute the monies uh, equitably. It doesn't matter whether you happen to financially, because who knows what else you did extremely well, but financially had a tough year. and This sure. person had financially a great year. We don't even think in those terms. It's it's This is how we did, mm-hmm. and and everything is distributed equally amongst us um how did the other offices uh come into existence then were they were they initially kind of satellite offices for certain projects and then you decided that we're going to kind of maintain and keep them there okay so the first one was our honolulu office that was our first one and uh we have a uh one of my partners adam woltag who was one of the first uh you know that, that came with us was born and raised uh in oahu Mm-hmm. And he wanted, uh, yeah, he wanted to return. And he said, I think we can do what we're doing here uh, in um, in uh, in Hawaii. I think I think we should open an Oahu office, uh, a Honolulu office, excuse me. And yeah. um, and uh, I said, no, you're, you're nuts. You know, there's like a million <laughs> and a half people that live there. He goes, well, no, I think I can do it. So okay, in our model, we said, all right. <laughs> Go give it a shot, you know, like we'd figured out how much it would take. And uh, my partner, Jeff Warner, and Pauline Souza were very interested in helping Adam. And so uh, they took uh, K-12 schools uh, over to um, uh, Hawaii, and uh, and they were successful. And they started uh, winning work and started doing some really beautiful things. And it seemed to be... Um, uh, working and so we we held on to it and it's been it's been wonderful. Amazing. And then New York, um, my partner uh, Brian Childs, who's one of the founding partners, he had been talking to a couple of our senior employees who who left us to move back to New York for family reasons. About well, I think we could open up an office in New York, you know, with these with these uh, these two guys, Stephen Kelly and John Miguel, and. Uh, and ultimately, Brian, uh, you know, brought that to us and said, I'd like to go back there and help them do it. And so we did. We opened the uh, New York City office based on basically uh, a couple of our senior people who used to work with us, having had to move back to New York, convincing us that we should open a New York office and Brian being committed to doing that. And so and so we did. And then Seattle was different. Microsoft and Meta, to a certain extent, uh, brought us. To Seattle, right. uh, with some big work, and um, and so we opened an office to do that. And then my partner Kyle Elliott, um, who joined us about three or four years after we uh, founded the firm, but we'd worked with Kyle for a long time, decided to move his family to Seattle, and so mm-hmm. he runs now our our Seattle office. So they're slightly different. Why these offices opened? Um, I would love to tell you it was super strategic, and wow, we did all the math. 
but it was more opportunistic. And and here's a moment. Do we want to seize the moment? And well, it's it's and, quite interesting because you you got you got the New York and the uh, Honolulu offices, which were kind of not necessarily you didn't necessarily have work there. It just seemed like a good idea, and and sort of personal connections and relations. And then the Seattle one was much more. There was it was more specific projects that kind of uh, that that grew. And and what's the the kind of um, interchange, if you like, between staff members in those offices? Do people often change offices, or do you recruit locally? When you say that it's um, it's one studio, four different locations. Yeah. How it, how is thing how are things centralized, and how do you prevent kind of repeat roles being made, and what bits are kind of localized in San Francisco? Yeah, uh, people uh, do relocate. Um, it's not often, but you know, a few people have, you know, wanted to move either from New York to the Bay Area or Seattle or, you know, the thing, thing that does happen and we facilitate that. And of course, that's all fine and good. Um, but I would say in the main, the other aspect of us being one office is we will build a team around a project from any of our offices. Right. Uh, because if, if it's the right set of skills, and they want to work together on this thing, you know, we will build it. You know, we, we, we have a couple of, we have many projects that might have uh, someone in Seattle, someone in San Francisco, someone in New York and a team, you know, around them that are doing a thing in Austin, you know, or in Chicago or whatever. And um, that frankly proved to be very uh, good for us when COVID hit because we were, we were super used to working uh, with one another remotely um, across different time zones, yeah. and and it was it's just something that we've always done. We don't try to hold on to you know revenues in a certain location or a project opportunity. Um, we're doing work for the College of the Desert in Palm Springs right now, and I think half of our team is in New York, and the other half is here in San Francisco. Because of the skill sets they represent and what they can do, and it, it's not—it sounds odd, but it, it actually it doesn't feel at all strange to mm. us because of how we work. What, how, what kind of technology do you use to make that happen? How do team meetings kind of coexist? How do design conversations happen? Because that does sound, yeah, really kind of very forward-thinking and and innovative to to actually be able to work on one project which is in a different location than the teams actually spread across your different locations in the office. Yeah. Well, we're using, you know, well, we, I think we, our default uh, meeting platform is Zoom, but I mean, our clients, we use Teams and we use BlueJeans, if that's still around, and uh, Cisco. You know, we, we use anything our clients insist, but internally, I think we, we tend to go to Zoom when we use mirror boards to move information around and uh, share and, and everything that matters on a project is in our cloud, uh, which is the Azure cloud, Microsoft Azure cloud is what we're in, um, is in the cloud. And so every, all the file sharing, all the back and forth is, is pretty, is pretty um, uh, seamless. I mean, there's, there's really no issues there. We've got a wonderful IT uh, group and I wish I could speak to you more about all of that, but it's not what I do for us. So sure. uh, I, I, I'm in my sixties and so it's a, <laughs> I'm just amazed at what it can do. I'm amazed I'm on this call that I actually was able to <laughs> to get on. But um, and then uh, and then we fly people around. You know, I mean, there's times you have to be together, and so we mm -hmm. fly people around and and put them up in hotels, and uh, so teams will do that. In fact, I think the COD team was in the office just a couple of weeks ago for about a week. Do, the New York a, side was in our yeah. Do, do, do a big culture of work from home, or is it people that people are literally really working inside um, of these in these different locations, and then you work digital, you work digitally, kind of internally, if you like. Yeah, we, um, work from home. Well, let's talk about that. So, I we, you can work anywhere, really. That that's true, uh, but we don't think you do your best work like that. That's why we even fly people out because you got to be together from time to time yeah so so our default what we say is you know we built a studio physical studio so we could work in the studio and so that's where we work but even prior to covid we were pretty flexible with our staff so you know we didn't want anyone coming in if they were sick if if their family was sick you know stay home you know um because you know especially with the young children it's like 
you're sick many weeks of the year. Uh, stay home with that. If you, if you got some pressures, other, other pressures, uh, you know, just go deal with those, those pressures. If there's a, a soccer game, you know, a play, something you need to get to, go do that. You know, I mean, in other words, when life was throwing something at you and you needed to, to have some flexibility, we didn't, we didn't want to get in the way of that. But the default is you work in the studio. So it's not like, oh, you know, I'm having a bad hair day, so I'm going to stay home. It's like that, that, that's not a reason to stay home. We need you mm-hmm. in the studio so that we could learn from you, right? Um, and, and we just believe in that level of collaboration, right? So that's met fairly, uh, I, I mean, I think because we share these values, I, th- I think people really get that in the main. There's a, there's, it's a little, there can be a little bit of contention around that because of what other, uh, companies are doing so sure. we can hear about that but but in the main i think people understand that you know we built this the physical studio because we want to collaborate in that studio and the default is you work in the studio that and, said i mean we are highly flexible with our yeah. staff and um, in terms of identifying new leaders in the business and kind of you know we, we, we we're talking about succession and the way that the the structure the governance structure is set up how do you identify new leaders and have them move through um and, and kind of step into their own leadership positions if you like what sorts of training do they need to kind of go through how do you identify them how do they get enrolled in the kind of working aspects of yeah. the business and not just focused on design yeah we we do provide uh various trainings uh there are also uh, a lot of internal uh, uh, kinds of exchanges, the mentoring and, and exchanges that occur uh, within the studio. But I, I would tell you that uh, a leader will will emerge. You'll you, there will be people that will be, you can begin to to see um, um, that others are willing to follow. Because they're trusted, um, they are uh, they they have a, a natural ability to take who they are and their skill sets and their talents and and put them out there. And people say, "I want to listen to what this person is saying. I want I want to know what they know. I want to I'm gravitating toward them." And you can see that happening. You know, when you it's like when you when you think of the system you have, you can see. Um, certain people emerging in that way. And then you, you might move to a little bit of mentoring and training of those people, right? To, to, to allow them to see what's happening around them and how to be a better leader. And then ultimately, um, like John, John and Jeff, uh, two of the, um, founding partners I, I spoke of, they've retired. They're, they're, they're gone. Um, and in their place are, are Tim Morrishead and Lillian Asperin and, um, Russ Sherman, so they they join us, right? And yeah. and these three were natural leaders, and people were uh, at different leading different sorts of things entirely, but they were deeply respected by our staff and and understood to be leaders. So it was almost it was a natural step mm-hmm. to say, oh, let's okay. So now you also now are my partner. Uh, and and you're buying up some of those shares, and there's a financial thing to that, and all of that. But in the main, what you're doing is joining our leadership circle. We want your voice there. You you have the the temperament um, to uh, to understand, you know, the the role of of leading a studio like ours. Mm-hmm. And and you know, so I would say you don't. Yeah, you, it requires some patience and it requires empathy, not in the sense of, of sympathy, but just in the sense of being empathetic, of, of understanding uh, a person um, and then allowing them to grow as they are growing uh, in that role of being a leader. Does, does that, 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 does that make sense? sense? Yeah, and I, mean, I like the way that you, you phrased it there in terms of leaders actually emerge. And it's something that you kind of you just get a sense of, and there is a natural there's a natural communication and and trustworthiness 
and they've already created an environment where people are naturally following them or you know very ready to follow them do, do you ever have people actually kind of individually putting themselves forward and say hey like i want to become a partner what is it that i need to do um to to kind of get onto that track yeah i mean uh you you do i mean obviously uh sometimes it's not i want to be a partner it's you know but there are uh people uh should advocate for themselves i believe you should advocate for yourself we need to be as um as candid as we can be in our assessment of what the person is asking us without being um <laughs> you know without without being uh, uh, uh somehow uh, limiting of mm-hmm. what a person may become uh, i'm a big believer uh that our firm or you know this this WNS studio which is just is just a drop in a giant pond um you know, it could be a great place for someone to emerge as a leader, but others might need to go somewhere different to emerge as a leader. They they need to, they need to be in a different system. Um, and I can be very candid about that. You know, my assessments of folks and and is it are they in are are they fitted well where they have found themselves, or do they need to see the broader picture? You know, we're like I said, oh, uh, this profession of ours, architecture. There's many many. Uh, ways of being in it uh, and 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 i mean from at all you know scales of work types of work jog where where you are uh the kinds of of a firm it is its history there's many ways of being in it and and i think people just need to find where they're best fitted and what their own personal goals are so uh yeah there are times it's, it's, you know, in the main, you know, it's, it's younger staff. And so it's hard to, you know, so I mo- mostly try to just give a little guidance and mentorship and watch them and talk to them about, but ultimately as they mature, it's like, Hey, th- this may not be the right place. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I, you have these abilities, you can get there, but probably not here for these what, reasons, whatever it might be. What, what is for at, at uh, WRNS, what, what makes a good leader? What, what are the sorts of skill sets that they might have and the kind of aptitudes that they might have? You already mentioned a few, you know, in terms of communication and kind of trustworthiness and having an ability where people are, are following them. But are there any other sorts of domains that they need to be knowledgeable in? Yeah. One, I think whatever your uh, whatever it is you do, you need to be incredibly competent. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, our staff needs to, our staff's very smart. So you you need to be, hey, you need to know what you're talking about. <laughs> and people need to have a, a respect for you, right? So so in that respect is going to come in part through just your competency. Your skills and your talents um, are, you know, they're understood. Uh, and then out of that, um, you can't, a good leader is not arrogant in that skill and that talent and that competency. There's no arrogance there because because that your the, the basic and I think I mentioned it the basic value of curiosity is saying I I I don't know everything. I still need to go find out something. I you know and maybe this person right here you know right out of school has something to teach me mm-hmm. right and you have to have that openness to establish that dialogue with that person. So of course they're going to learn a lot more from you than you're going to learn from them, but you do have something to learn. And you and that's you got to wear that on your face. You know, you um being a partner at WNS Studio is 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 uh <laughs> there's no crown. There's no crown that comes with that. <laughs> you know, uh you're just part of a team and you're trying to get the best out of out of uh out of the work. Uh and so uh, that's what makes for a good partner. So a bit of humility um, uh, coupled with uh, a high level of, of capability. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, are, are, there, are there other skills that you, that in, that you encourage with partners? Because it's interesting when, when we look at, when I talk with the businesses about succession planning or kind of worked with clients in the past, even when, when they've been going through succession planning, often a, a partner is, you know, if they haven't run a business before in them, themselves, things like winning work might be a bit of a mystery, or even some of the more business systems and functions that might be a bit of a mystery. But though they might be very, very talented in terms of the domain of design, um, is there 
are you looking for people as well who have got those skill sets in say winning work and the business side of stuff or does that kind of get trained or was it uh, spread winning, or was... winning work is is interesting you know uh we've always felt and i believe this to be true that uh doing good work is winning work so you you put you put your work um and by work i mean not not just the 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 physical architecture that ultimately gets built and people respond to and critique and um, uh, applaud or, or awards get won, but but also just who you are, you know, how you executed that work, um, you know, how you work through the entitlement, the relationship with the authorities having jurisdiction, the builder partners, the the engineering community. I mean, who you who we are in that in that world is a is a big part of winning work. Because you develop a reputation, um, you develop a brand. People understand uh, word of mouth, and and suddenly you become viable. That said, uh, some of us um, are fairly good at communicating that right at the moment of an interview or the writing of a proposal. Um, others, you know, I'm talking at the partner level, um, focus less on that, and that's all okay. You know, we don't need everyone to do that. And and we don't over applaud the winner of the work, you sure. know, because really what's winning the work is the is the is the recognition of the studio itself and everything that the studio can do. Yeah. So, yeah, you have to have people who are willing to uh, present themselves to the market and, and communicate um, to the market who we are. But that doesn't need to be everybody. And other people have different skill sets that are all needed to create this thing um, that is the studio. On the business side, it, it's similar. You know, I've always uh, I spent uh, two and a half years at at uh, San Jose State as a business major, and I've I there was an awful in some of the structure stuff I talked about I, I saw there um, uh, things I'm curious about personally about these things. And so I've always leaned into that. John Rufo, who's now retired, mm -hmm. he also had a kind of an interest in this, like how this thing actually worked. Uh, now I'm working with uh, Brian Millman, who's one of my partners, um, you know, on a lot of these similar issues. And and with our, along with our CFO, um, you know, we, it's interesting, we just enjoy these conversations and, and er but everybody gets involved in it. However, a lot of people have, uh, most people have, um, you know, will rely on uh, those that are most curious about these things and the, and how they work. So again, you don't need everybody engaged in those things. You just need trusted. <laughs> Everyone trusted needs to be who... trusted. And, right, and trusted, and there needs to be enough of us at the right ages to keep the ship moving. Brilliant. I don't know. Brilliant, brilliant. What are you most looking forward to um, for twenty twenty rest of twenty twenty three and moving into twenty twenty four? Yeah, twenty three definitely uh, a difficult year, uh, a kind of a transition year um, for us, and and yet a lot of good things are happening. Uh, uh, wonderful projects are, are are finally completing uh, through the, their COVID build, and um, there's been just a, a, and some a lot of a wonderful project being won as well. Um, so, so that's all that. Yeah, and I became a grandfather this year, and, and so many good things. Congratulations! <laughs> in twenty three. So when I say it's a difficult year, it's just it's been a it's been an odd year because we've just seen a lot of our our clients struggling, you know, mm -hmm. with their own identities and and what they want to do, and and uh, we you know we're sort of participating with them on that, but it it just makes it just makes things a little less a little murky. Less clear. I think 24 is going to be uh, an awesome year. I think it's going to be a very busy year and a time of, of establishing, um, you know, basically what's next, you know, and, and what what the use case is for the things that we do, at least in the work that I'm mostly involved in today. And coupled with, at least in California, you know, we're doing a lot of housing right now and, and, and we need that housing. And so uh, that's an ongoing. Uh, concern, you know, for the state, and we're participating in that in a big way. And I see that really taking root and and moving forward um, uh, strongly. So I'm 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 super looking forward to 24. Brilliant.
Brilliant. Well, that's a perfect place to conclude the conversation there, Sam. Thank you so much yeah. for giving us that deep dive into uh, your your firm. Really, really fascinating and really, really enlightening, actually, hearing how your um, sociocratic kind of non-hierarchical governance structure works and how you how you keep the business successful. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. Good call. And that's a wrap. Oh, yeah. One more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.